Have you guys, have you guys ever noticed that there's like one thing in your life? There's one thing in your life. Okay, get this right. There's one thing in your life that just you can't seem to get it right. I don't know about you. How many people here, one thing to you is a good night's sleep? Right? That's my one thing. I mean, if I can get a good night's sleep, I can handle it. In fact, I heard a story about this baseball team that was traveling. And uh, what's these boys? And they were going across the country. They had all these coaches. And they had this one coach. They had to share rooms because it was too expensive. So the coaches would share rooms together with two double beds. You know, one would sleep in one and the other. And, uh, and there's this guy named Coach Pierre. And Coach Pierre could snore. He could snore the, the pictures off the walls. So no one wants to go with Coach Pierre. So the first night, Coach Jack goes with Coach Pierre. And he, this guy's snoring. All night, he's watching him like, will he stop snoring? The next morning at the breakfast buffet, his eyes are all bloodshot. And Pierre, Coach Pierre, is, hey, guys, how you doing? How you doing? And, 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 and the other guy's like, I am exhausted. Someone else needs to sleep with Coach Pierre's room tonight. So Coach David sleeps with Coach Pierre in the same room, and he's watching him all night, snoring. So the following day, he gets in there, his eyes all bloodshot, and Coach Pierre is fine at the breakfast bar. So the following night, John says, I'll sleep in the room with him. So he sleeps in the room with him, and the following morning, Coach Pierre, his eyes are all bloodshot. He barely gets in. He says, oh, I'm exhausted. I could barely sleep last night. And then Coach John walks in, bright-eyed and bushy, and, and it's like, well, what happened? John, well, John, what did you do? How could you sleep with that coaching? Oh, it's very simple, he said. I went up to him. I, I fixed his bed. I tightened the sheets. I gave him a kiss in the forehead. <laughs> and he watched me all night. I don't know if that's appropriate or not, but get over yourself. <laughs> we, we all have that one thing in our life. If we could just get this one thing correct, we think, man, if I could just get over this one thing, the fear of failure, or if my marriage, or if I could find someone to marry, or I could find someone to bury. You're wondering which one it is. If I could just get this right career, man, if I could just let go of this thing that bugs me. And how many of you have ever done this? This happens to me. Uh, maybe I'm the only person here. How many ever lose your keys, your car keys? Right? And you got to go. And you're looking all around the house, and of course, it's everyone else's fault. So someone moved my key. And you're, you're swear it's the case, and you're looking all around. You cannot get to the next place until you find that one thing, right? That one thing is the key to the next thing. That one thing is the key to the next thing. You need to get your car keys. Well, let me tell you right now, there's one thing in your life that's the key to the next thing, and you can't seem to go to the next thing because that one thing is in your way. We all have a one thing, right? Come on, let's be honest. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's apathy. Maybe it's failure. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's you eat too much corn or watch porn. I don't know. You struggle. I'm serious. You just, I wish I could get over this one thing. I drink too much. I swear too much. I worry too much. I get angry too much. And there's always something else in the way. That one thing that holds me back. If I could just get that one thing behind me. They teach you in business. Really good, good exercise. This is what they say. If you could change one thing that would make the greatest difference, what would that be? And that's a good question. If you could chase, change one thing in your life that would make the biggest difference in your life, what would it be? And I would say to you today, if you could change one thing in your life, what would be the most important thing? Well, the truth of the matter is we often think about that one thing. We have all had that one thing that holds us back. And we often pray for God, we often pray to God to remove this one thing from our lives so we can achieve more. But the problem is deeper than that one thing. Someone told me this, it's not one thing, it's another. If it's not one thing, it's another. Probably one of my favorite, least favorite cliches in the world. But it always seems to be that one thing. Well, how do we get over that one thing? What does the Bible say about it? I'm so glad you asked because we're going to get it into today. Jesus 
is teaching. He's having an amazing ministry. People are seeing him do miracles. He's preaching. He's laying hands on the blind and recovering. It's amazing. And, and all of a sudden, he has an entourage that's surrounding him, and a, there's a young guy who's of good report. And this guy is, he's got money. He's got a great education. He's in church all the time, right? Imagine, imagine if you will, uh, for you guys that have daughters, imagine, if you will, a guy drives up in a Bentley, brand new, 2024. He drives up in a Bentley, comes out. He's at the church. He's helping the poor. He goes on the streets and, and does all these wonderful things. He's in the church leadership. He speaks once in a while. This guy's amazing. I mean, this guy's amazing. You're like, I have a daughter. <laughs> Can I hear an amen? I got a daughter, all right? And this is the kind of guy you want to be your son-in-law because not only, he's not an outlaw. He's your, he wants to be your son-in-law, and he's got money. He loves Jesus. He serves in the church, right? What else can you worry about? You're ready to retire, okay? <laughs> but here's a story in the Bible that kind of illustrates that. I'm kind of setting it up to kind of bring it to modern standards, if you will. This is the true story. This is not a parable. Jesus meets this. We all have heard of the guy, the rich, young ruler, right? We would love this guy. And, and he comes to Jesus. We're going to go through this passage, and it's very interesting as we look through this passage. And he was setting out on his journey. A man ran, not walked, ran. And that's a pretty big deal because you're very dignified. You're, you kind of walk like this, a little swagger. You know, hey, Jesus, what's up? You know, I don't know, this guy, this guy was running. I mean, he was making kind of a fool of himself, if you think about it. Probably has to pick up his, uh, they used to wear these like togas, pick it up and running. He's running towards Jesus. Like, who's this guy? Everyone's like, is that who I think it is? He's running? So he's running. So he's, he doesn't care about his reputation. Think about that. Doesn't care about his reputation. So the man ran up and knelt before him. He's like this, kneeling before him. He's basically saying, I kneel down before you. I subject myself to you. You know, in the Eastern culture today, they'll, they'll kind of give you a little bow. This guy wasn't just bowing. This guy was on his knees, which was a position you would sit before a rabbi and you would listen to your rabbi. So this guy's like, everyone's like, wow, is that who I think it is? Yes, it is. It's that rich, young ruler. And he's sitting before Jesus. He knelt before him and he asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Good question. He knows that there's something missing in his life, and there has to be eternal life. Jesus is talking about, and what does Jesus say to him? He says, why do you call me good? Why do you call me good? So he's elevating Jesus, call him a good teacher. No one's good except God alone. So he's kind of seeing where the guy's at. We could talk more about that, but we'll get into the story. You know the commandments, Jesus says. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness. He goes on, do not defraud, honor your mother and your father. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. This guy is amazing, absolutely amazing. And then look what happens next. And Jesus looking at him, loved him. I want you to look at that there. He loved him. What does that mean? It's the word agape. He loved him. He was not angry with him. Ah, oh, you jerk, you rich guy, you. He looked at him with compassion. Listen, everybody, before we start bringing correction to culture, you can't correct someone you don't love. What? Yeah, Jesus loved the world. Doesn't agree with the world. But he loved the man. He loved the man. He looked at the man. Why? He was concerned for the man. He was concerned for him. He loved him. He agaped him. And the word agape means I'm going to love you despite what you do to me. I'm not looking for a transaction. I'm not trying to get something out of you. I'm not trying to close the sale. I'm not trying to put a salvation notch on my belt. I saved another one. No, he literally cared about the guy. He didn't care about anything else. He looked at the man and he loved him. And he told them, listen, you're rich, you're young, you're a good guy. Come into the church, we're going to raise you up. But what does he say? He doesn't do that. Jesus looking at him and said to him, you lack 
What? One thing. There's one thing you lack. What's that one thing? What's that one thing you lack? Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Go sell all that you have. Now, that's a big deal for this guy. Sell everything. Sell all you have and give it to the poor, and you'll have treasures in heaven, and then come and follow me. Listen, everybody, there are people that have done this, read the scripture verse. One of the greatest monks, Francis of Assisi, was extremely wealthy. He left his entire fortune behind that was inherited, and he sold everything he had, and he took a vow of poverty, and he followed Jesus and had a whole monastic rite that rose up as a result of him. Amazing. People today will sell all they have, give it all away, and serve Jesus, and they're still missing it. Now, there are some people that do that are, are, are not missing it. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm so glad that Jesus said it was a rich young ruler. Whew, that surely isn't me. I'm not young anymore, and I'm not rich. So I'm, I guess I'm okay. I guess I'm okay. Well, I've got good news and bad news for you. Look at your neighbor say you're rich. How can you say that? Well, maybe you're not rich. According to what I've read in the last two years, if you make, over $45,000 a year. You're in the top 1% of the population of the world. So you're rich. The fact that you have to spend $50, $100 a month on the storage container tells you you're rich. The fact that you get up in the morning and I don't know what to wear Right? The, the fact that you, you have a $1,200 phone in your pocket that you can go on the internet and, and, and you can spend over an hour. My wife and I have done this. What do we watch? And we're sitting there looking through thousands of titles. We can't find anything to watch. Am I the only guy? There's just nothing to watch. When I grew up, we had three channels in a UFH that you had to go like this to get the signal. That's why I'm so flexible. <laughs> you have all these things, right? This one thing, I want you to give it all away. You, you and I are rich. So it's not about the money. Aren't you glad? Whew. Whew. He says, go sell all you have and give it to the poor. You have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. That's, that's really key. Are we following Jesus? Are we following religion? Are we following going to church? No. Come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away. Very sorrowful. Very sorrowful. For he had great, great, great possessions. So here we have a situation where he was very wealthy and sometimes we don't recognize that there's something, the thing that you hold on to sometimes takes you away. So look what he says next. Jesus says, he looked, at, he looked around and said this, disciples, how difficult, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, I wonder why in our culture that God is an afterthought. Well, we nothing else to do today for Sunday. Let's just go to church. The big E's over. Durham Fair's over. They do have the Apple Festival in, in Southington, but we'll go later. We'll get the fritters later. And we'll pray to God to take off the calories. But our donuts are better. Can I hear an amen? Our donuts are better. There's a reason why the church is growing. I can barely button my jacket. We're not going to talk about that. He looked around and he said to him, how difficult is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? Why? Because when you have wealth, you have options. You can kind of choose what you want to do. And the disciples were amazed at these words. You see, the one thing is often the very thing that keeps us in prison and limits what could fully be ours in Christ. That one thing limits the excellence, the adventure, the uh, uh, life full of meaning because you and I have that one thing. What is that one thing in your life? We all have a different thing. That's the problem. Well, there's one thing. You know how you catch a monkey? You probably heard this illustration. It's called a monkey trap. Okay. Looks like my brother, but I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> you take this coconut, 
You put some nuts in there or bananas or whatever, and you, you tie it to the wall, and this monkey goes in there, and, and can, they didn't make it where you can fit the hand in, but as long as you clench your fist, you can't get it out. So the monkey's like this, trying to get the thing out, and as the monkey does it, the trappers come and get him. You know, I think a lot of us are trying to grab wealth, self-respect, beauty, trying to look young forever. It's an amusing proposition, by the way. I know it's okay to look good, but man, you've, good luck with that one, right? Have you noticed? Okay, now we'll leave that alone. You young people enjoy it while you can. Okay, so now, so you put it in there and you, you can't let go. And as a result of that, that monkey gets trapped. And maybe that's for you. Maybe this is you today. You're coming in today like this. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. We got this one thing in our life. And then Jesus talks about what is this one thing that's stopping us. And, and by the way, there's something very interesting here that we often think about, well, you know, I'll, I guess I'll suffer for Jesus. Uh, you know, I heard people say this, you know, pastors say this. I've, I've surrendered the call to the ministry and I'm a pastor. No one, no, no one or no one comes to the church. You're miserable. I surrendered to the call to the pastor. No, it shouldn't be that. I surrendered and I'm free. But what did Jesus talk about this? Jesus talked to his disciples. Now, they, now is a teaching moment, all right? He says to them, but Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I've heard some great sermons about this eye of the needle in Jerusalem. Apparently, there's this wall and there's this little tiny uh, gate and you have to get off your camel and you have to squeeze. No, there's not such, no such thing as an eye of a needle gate. When Jesus says an eye of a needle, he's talking about an eye of a needle. It's kind of a humorous thing he uses. It's a, it's a saying back in the day in that time. It's easier for a man to go through an eye of a needle than enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, okay, uh, <laughs> all right. And they were exceedingly astonished. Why? Because they thought in their day, if you were living godly and you had money, God's hand was upon you, right? Obviously, this must be a man or woman of God. They got a lot of cash. No, no. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to them, who can be saved? Because this was like what you want to be. This, this rich young ruler was what you want to be. Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible. So many of us are trying to follow God, and it's impossible. I just can't do it. At the men's breakfast this past Wednesday at 6 a.m., all men are invited. We have one on Friday, at, at also at 7, and also Wednesday night. A gentleman was sharing that, you know, it was all about this, uh, that one thing. And going after something, trying to get something, and not getting what you really want. And, and you're chasing after all these things, and it's not satisfying. It, they're, they're, why? He looked at them with, man, it's impossible. You can try all you want. And in fact, this man was, was sharing that he grew up in a church where it was called the church I can't and you better. All right? I go to, what church you go to? I go to First Can't Church. Which one do you go to? You better or else church. And, and it's like, you better, and, he, and there's rules. And I just can't do it. I, frankly, I can't do it. I'm sorry. I, I give up. I, I, there's no way I could do what you're doing. Live like you live. I mean, it's incredible. There's no way I could match that, so forget it. We get discouraged because sometimes we spend so much time talking about the things of God, we forget God. And Jesus said this. He said, all things are possible with God. Amen. The only way you and I can pursue God is with God. You can't pursue God without God because if you try, you'll be disappointed. Because you're going to come short. Well, what does that mean? I don't understand. Well, look what Peter had to say. Then Peter said to him, see, we've left everything, Jesus, which they did. They left their nets. They left their business behind. They left the data behind. And they followed Jesus. That was a big deal for them, by the way, everybody. See, we've left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly. In other words, listen up, guys. Hey, listen up. I say to you, there's no one who's left houses or brothers or sisters, or mothers, or father, or children, or lands, for my sake and for the gospel. 
Now you're thinking, great, I can leave my family, I can leave. No, he's not talking about that. He's talking about in that culture, you would lose everything by giving your life to Jesus. Following Jesus would cost you something. In nations of the world like North Korea, Iran, and other places, you can lose your own life. This is what he said. Listen to this. He said, truly, I told you, there's no one who's left houses or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers, children or lands, for my sake and for the gospel, which is good news, who will not receive a hundredfold. What does that say? Now, praise God. Okay, ushers, come on now. We're going to take an offering right now. Give me $1,000 and I've got $10,000 back. God's going to reward you. And you, know, you hear all this talk and, and, and it's sort of true, but it's not. He's not talking about material wealth. He's way beyond that. You see, what do we have money for? We have money so we can be happy, right? I can buy things. My family can go to the right school. We can go on the right vacation. And so what is the reason I'm pursuing money? Because I have choice, and I, my choice hopefully will make me happy. Look what happened to Matthew Perry from Friends. He reached the pinnacle of the mountain, and he realized it was nothing there. You see, a lot of us are chasing things. And Jesus is saying, now, if you give it all up, you're going to have, receive a hundredfold now. What does that mean? Nothing can touch me. I'm giving my life to Jesus. I know who I am. I know where I'm going. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I'm satisfied with things this world cannot give me. You are so wealthy, you're beyond wealth because you're the happiest person around. Because you are beyond material possessions. You found the true wealth that's really there. He says, he says, hundredfold now, in this time, talks about houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with, what does that say? Oh, persecutions. Yeah, persecution is not you're at the end of the line at Starbucks. No, that's not persecution. <laughs> Though it does take forever. Have you noticed? Okay. But I have no comment. And in the age of coming, eternal life. You see, what is the one thing in your life that holds you back from following Jesus? What is it? What's the one thing in your life? And I've known people that have come and said, oh, I'm going to serve Jesus, like that young man. I would do anything for love, but I won't do. That's called meatloaf. <laughs> I like meatloaf. The real meatloaf, the, the one you eat. But there's a song, I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. Well, that one thing is holding you back. What's the one thing? I'm so glad you asked what that one thing is. What is the one thing that holds you from following Jesus? It could be success. It could be pleasure. It could be pride and even failure. In fact, you could try that one thing and still miss it. You could try to serve God. For example, there was this, you might have heard of it, there was this Mary and Martha, I don't have to go through the whole story, but basically they had Jesus at the house, and, and Martha is like cooking up a storm. She's got the meatballs and spaghetti, she's got the whatever, veal parmesan, chicken parmesan, and all the great parmesans, out. everything parmesan is awesome, okay? <laughs> and she's cooking up a storm and taking care of things, and there is Mary sitting at Jesus' feet, just sitting there while she's going crazy. And she says, Jesus, do you not care all the work I'm doing? I'm doing everything, and there's Mary. You ever feel that way? I go to church. I pay my tithes. I invite my mother-in-law for dinner. I do all these things. I have a great mother-in-law, but others don't. I've done everything you've asked me to do, Jesus. I even, I do everything. And why is this other person doing nothing? He says, no. What, what, what's the issue here? What's that one thing? Mary and Martha, trying to do it. The one thing, trying to live for Jesus. Jesus says, Mary has chosen the one thing. It will not be taken from her. What's the one thing? Time with Jesus. When you spend time with Jesus, you give him everything you have, does something supernatural happen? He begins to multiply your life. You see, the one thing, trying to live for Jesus doesn't work. That's what Martha was trying to do. We have to stop trying to live for Jesus. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Stop trying to live for Jesus. Let me just tell you, I've tried. It doesn't work. And sometimes I still try to live for Jesus. 
Jesus does not want us to try to live for him. Jesus doesn't want you to try to live for him. Jesus doesn't want you living for him. Jesus wants you living with him. With him, not for. You see, you can live for Jesus and never know Jesus, but it's impossible to live with Jesus and not live for Jesus. There's a vast thing. It's called a real relationship. And you see, that's what Mary chose. She chose to do the one thing that's necessary. Mary has chosen. You and I have to choose to do that one thing, to be with Jesus, not to live for Jesus, but to live life with Jesus. And when you live life with Jesus, you can live for Jesus, but you can live for Jesus and not live with Jesus. And that's what exhausts you. You see, the one thing is to start living with Jesus. What does that mean? That means he's always before me. He's the crosshair of my life. Whatever I'm firing at, whatever I'm doing, he's the crosshairs of everything. He's in the middle of my vision. And whatever's driving me away, this has to go. This has to go. There's a burning house and I have to run out. I'm going to knock the obstacles away to get through that door. And that door is Jesus. You see, whatever we focus upon will be drawn towards. It happens all the time. Whatever we focus upon, whether good or bad. They've done studies. There was a study about, this gentleman did a study a number of years ago. He's a psychologist, and he basically told a group of people, I don't want you to think of a white bear. And of course, what did everyone do? Okay, I'm going I'm to be better. I don't want you thinking about pink elephants flying through the air. Okay? Look at your neighbor and say, don't think about pink elephants flying through the air. And I'll tell your other neighbor, you better not think of a pink ele elephant. Now, I got an entire room of people thinking about flying pink elephants. It does not work. They did another study where they asked people, they had a lot of pain. I want you to think about how to, how to, okay, I want you to focus on how to reduce your pain. Just think about how to reduce it. Okay, I don't want to be in pain. I don't want to be in pain. They found that 20 to 30% of people that try not to have pain had more pain. The people who forgot about their pain and focus on something else did a lot better. Whatever you focus upon, you will drive towards. If you try to stop smoking, you'll smoke more. I can't look at porn. I can't look at porn. I'll eat corn. Eat corn instead. It rhymes. I can't help it. But seriously, if you try to stop drinking, I can't drink. I can't drink. I can't drink. I can't drink. I can't have alcohol. I can't eat the cake. I can't have the donuts after the service. I can't. 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 Well, the pastor did say that it doesn't count until you leave. The calories don't stick out until you leave. So what happens is you start thinking about that thing. You drive towards whatever you think about. That's, and we talked about this so many times. It, it's, it's fact. So you'll drive towards, instead of driving towards stop doing, drive towards what you're supposed to do. Shift your focus. Jesus, the one thing that truly matters. Here's my job. Here's Jesus. Is it getting in the way? Well, how do I arrange this job in the right way? Is this relationship? Is this young man I'm with or young woman I'm with? Is this person coming between Jesus and me? I did it for a while. Oh, I want to marry this woman. Hey, hi, Jesus. I'm like, I'm like a teenager coming home late at night who's guilty of something. And hi, mom. And, hi, dad. And go right to your room. I did that for Jesus for a little while. Hey, Jesus. Good to see you. It's good to see you. But I don't want him asking me the question, are you willing to give her up for me? That can happen. Shift your focus in Jesus as the one thing. The one thing. You see, the focus should not be, here's another one. The focus should not be, I got to clean myself up. I got to clean myself up. I got to get better. I got to do better at home. I, I, won't, I swear I won't get angry again. I won't do this again. And, and don't, don't waste your time trying to do that, trying to chase yourself. You see, what we want to do is stop chasing our problems. And what we want to do is start chasing Jesus. That's what we want to be able to do. The one thing we're talking about, Jesus says this. He says what? You know the story. I am. I am the way. 
You don't know which way to go? I am the way. Jesus is the way. He's the truth. He's the life. Whatever you go through, the crosshairs of Jesus has to always be before you. The only way you're going to hit targets is to have the crosshairs of Jesus. And the cross, it has to be before you and the world behind you. You see, don't resist, replace. Don't resist, replace. Don't try to stop doing something. Replace it with something else. If you, get, if you struggle at night with looking at things on the internet, then replace it with reading a book and turn off the Wi-Fi. Can I hear, oh no, I'll die without the Wi-Fi. <laughs> but I do have the network. No. Don't resist, replace. Let Jesus take first place. You see, we often make our struggles a God in disguise. We often make our struggles a God in disguise. Uh, in disguise. Well, if I could just get rid of this one thing, and we think about that thing all the time, or we make excuses for that thing all the time, and it crowds us out. Stop making that. You see, stop chasing your problems and start chasing Jesus. Guys, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of stuff to work on. Can I hear it? Oh, no. Right? I got a whole bunch of stuff I got to work on. And I'll be like this. I'll be running around like this all over the place, like, like a rat in a maze, not knowing which way to run, thinking each way is the right way. The best thing to do is this, follow Jesus. And every time Jesus brings something up to me, we'll deal with it. We have people come and, Pastor, this person, this per I saw them on the bar and they were drinking too much beer and they were smoking pot. And I saw them at the altar on Sunday. Yep, that's right. They just gave their life to Jesus. The Holy Spirit will deal with it. And sure enough, Pastor, I don't know what it is. I can't drink. I, I don't know. I, I don't feel it's right to drink alcohol. Am I right? I mean, I'll tell them about that, but yeah. Pastor, I don't think it's right that I live with my girlfriend anymore. I don't know what it is. The Holy Spirit will bring. I don't need to, you know, to stop chasing after behavior. Chase after Jesus, and he'll show you what to get rid of. So your one thing is not your bad habits. Your one thing is not anything else. Make Jesus your one thing, and if anything gets in the way of Jesus being the one thing, that thing has to go so Jesus can be the one thing. So stop chasing the one thing like a chicken with its head cut off. Now, isn't that simple, everyone? I, I got to do this. I gotta do that. Don't worry about it. My marriage, I got to do this. Don't worry about it. Focus on Jesus first. Give him the first. Live with Jesus, not for Jesus. See, the Bible's very clear about this. The Bible says, seek what? First, whatever's first becomes your thirst. What's the first thing in my day? <laughs> Can I hear an amen? Coffee. Okay. Well, the Bible, listen, guys, the Bible does say Hebrews, so it's okay. <laughs> but seek first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry. This is my, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now. This verse is like number one in my life. It is. This is my, this is my, my compass and my car in my life. I'm, I'm getting frustrated with the situation. Lord, am I seeking you first in this relationship with this person? Lord, am I seeking you first with the money that you've given me to a steward? God, am I seeking you first how to parent these children that are becoming teenagers and young adults? Father, am I seeking you first in these things? And you know what? Whatever's first becomes your thirst. I want to give Jesus the first. And all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Sufficient is today's problems. Can I hear? Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's true. For sure. In fact, you know, I don't know if you heard of this guy. He's one of the most amazing guys I've ever seen in my life. I never met him personally. Nick Vujicic. If I said it correctly, I practiced like, for like 20 minutes on this one. Each. Don't try to look at it right now. But this guy was born without limbs. It's a, it's a, it's a rare medical condition. Born without rim, rims. Born without limbs. And he grew up suicidal. For several years, he was destitute. He found Jesus, or Jesus found him. And he began to seek Jesus first and everything. In fact, I love this quote. <laughs> he says this, I have the choice to be angry at God for what I don't have or to be thankful for what I do have, I choose gratitude. Be anxious for nothing but with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. He chose what? He chose thanksgiving. I choose gratitude, knowing that Jesus is what? It's just one thing. Jesus is all I need. 
Nick understands he found the secret. He's got riches. He's got no limbs. How would you do without having limbs? Think about it. I don't want to think about it, frankly. Here's a guy that has nothing but Jesus. And everything changes in his life. In fact, look at this. Amazing. This guy, how does he do it? I don't know. Look, he's got family, a wife, children. Hello. He chose one thing. I am going after. Jesus. I'm not going to worry about not having limbs. I'm not going to worry about not having a job. I'm going to chase Jesus and whatever gets in the way of the crosshairs, I'm going to blow it to smithereens in Jesus' name. I take every thought captive and I make it obedient to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We take captive every stronghold, everything that exalts this person above Jesus, I take it captive. Is Jesus in your crosshairs? You see, chase passion for God. You see, here's another one. I don't even care. Maybe you're there today. I don't care. Chase passion for God. Passion is not an emotion. Passion is a choice. Love is not just an emotion. Love is a choice. Here's the good news. I'll go here real quick. Jesus says this. If you love me, you're obeying my commandments. In the freedom course, we talk about this all the time. Here's one way to look at it. Well, if you really love me, yeah, you do this, 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 and the other. It's obvious you don't love me. Or, if you would just love me, you're going to want to do everything else. You see, you're made by God to love God and be loved by God. And when you do your design you will have everything you need and you're going to work fine. You see, the Bible says this, whoever has my commandments, you have, to, you have to trust God. I'm going to trust God beyond what I feel. But listen, rules don't save you. Rules don't save you, but rules help you navigate on the road to relationship with God. I don't worship the guardrails. I don't worship the yellow line in the middle of the street. I don't worship the asphalt I'm going to a destination, and these things help me get there. They're not an end in themselves. Here's and very important. Whoever has my commandments and what? Keeps them is he who loves me. Now, check this out. Check this out, everybody. This is important. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will manifest myself. God will show himself to you, not because of your actions, because of your choice to follow him. And if you really love Jesus, you're going to do what he says. Can I hear an amen? So, daily surrender and choose to surrender to God. The Apostle Paul says, I die daily. Every day, my friends, you and I have to die daily. It's just part of what happens in our life. It's all about dying daily. You know, I want to end with this. It's this, brethren, sisters, I do not count myself having apprehended. This is the Apostle Paul, towards the end of his life. He's an old man now. I do not count myself having apprehended. But one thing, one thing, one thing I do, I what? Forgetting those things that lie behind. You need to stop looking at the past. You need to stop looking at your limitations. You need to stop looking at your health challenge and health problems. You need to stop looking at the deficit of your relationship, forgetting those things which are behind, and what? Reaching on for the things that are ahead. So we have to do that. We have to do it. I press on to the goal, the upward call of Jesus Christ. Have you do that? We have to forget what lies behind. Run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Stop looking about and around you. A tightrope walker, what they do, they don't look down. They look at where they're going. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Get Jesus in the crosshairs. Have the cross behind you. No, have the cross before you and die daily. Jesus says, unless you die daily, pick up your cross and follow me. And my God, my God, my God, what a wonderful thing to be. Have our life simplified. I don't have to chase everything. I chase one thing, Jesus. And I want to know Jesus. I want to live with Jesus. And when I live with Jesus, I'll live for Jesus. And my life will mount for something. Is Jesus your one thing? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. Lord Jesus, 
I pray there's anyone here watching online or home or wherever they're located that has not made you the first thing, that be willing to get rid of anything that would stop them from knowing you in Jesus' name. What's that one thing? Some of you need to get out of that relationship you're living in. Some of you need to move out. Some of you need to do a bunch of things. Remember, it's not the thing. It's about Jesus. Follow Jesus. Don't try to stop doing everything. Replace. Let me ask you a question. If you were to die, do you know absolutely for certain that you'd be with Jesus in heaven? Jesus is not looking for perfect people. Jesus is looking for surrendered people. The rich young man was unwilling to surrender. The disciples were willing to surrender. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? If you don't know for sure your condition of your soul, if you were to die, do you absolutely positively know you'd be in heaven with Jesus? Or maybe you used to walk with God, you're not walking anymore. Can I see a quick show of hands? Say, Pastor, I have not fully given my life to Jesus, or I, I used to walk and I'm not walking anymore. Can I see your hands nice and high? Several of you here right now. Nice and high. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, let's pray this prayer from our hearts. It's the heart. Lord Jesus, that's right, pray after the Lord. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. I ask you right now to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And I choose to follow you all the days of my life. I choose to make you my one thing. Amen.